Boiler Room Films present Leak. It's just another day at the office for Mario the Maintenance Man. Little did he know, it was about to turn into 30 stories of terror. Psh, Mario, there's like a uh, leak in the 12th floor server room. They're about to have a cow, man. Psh, Mario, there's a leak in the penthouse. It's killed all the elevators. Everything's down. Psh, uh, Mario, the basement's flooding and there's a tour group of kids trapped down there. One man, one wrench. Uh, wait, what? One wrench? Seriously? Come on, no way. Oh, uh, um, leak. Scary to the last drop. This film has not yet been rated and may not be suitable for all audiences. Hey, welcome back. Matt Nelson here, your host for HVAC 360, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. Simply put, we do that by sharing lessons learned and by talking with industry experts. Uh, but I don't stop there. I want to encourage you to double down on your weekly helping of HVAC knowledge by hopping on over to HVAC360.com and join my growing community of people just like you. In addition, what you're going to see when you jump over there is you're going to see what I rolled out. Uh, this is something new. It's a membership site. Uh, right now, it is open uh, at a deep discount for a limited number of people for a limited amount of time. So go to HVAC360.com today and check that out. All right, so what's up for this week? This week I wanted to share a little bit about what I know about equipment maintenance clearances, both on the electrical side and more on the physical side of things. Um, you know, this is one of those things as a designer uh, that can be really frustrating. Uh, if you, you know, it's not like you miss a load calculation. or It's, it's something physical uh, that you really can't get around if, if, if it goes wrong in the field. Um, so you got to do a lot of thinking ahead of time and try to stay ahead of the ball. Um, and there's a couple of different things that you can do. So let's, let's talk about the different factors uh, that contribute to the clearances of this uh, equipment and some of the maintenances. Um, obviously, factor one, it all starts with the basis of design. Now, basis of design is what you are designing around when you when you pick something it's not like it's just going to be uh whatever piece of equipment it's going to be a very specific piece of equipment and that uh, equipment has specific dimensions now you can get those dimensions from the manufacturer you can get the weights from the manufacturer and this is where you start to coordinate uh how much of a mechanical space you're going to need how much room and clearance that you're going to need in, in the different uh you know electrical rooms and, and anywhere you have a, like a metering room or, or wherever you have your mep equipment um you're also going to be uh, so you're going to be need that information to coordinate not only with the architect and the other tray uh, the other engineers, uh, but you're also going to need for structural information. So there's going to be weights there uh, that have implications down the road. Now, obviously, as the design goes along, there might be some changes, and it's and it's very important to note that this is not kind of like a one and done deal. You have to revisit it every time you change equipment. If the load changes, if you decided to use uh, some redundancy and add some equipment, you're going to have to go back and uh, reshare what you've done uh, with the architectural, the structural engineer, uh, all those people. You're going to have to go back and make sure that they have the right information. Uh, you, you're going to want to do this uh, as soon as possible. You don't want to wait at the end because some of these, including you know structural information, it's it's going to have some impact. It's going to have some delays. Um, architecturally, uh, you're going to have a, a a limited size. You want to make sure it's it's big enough uh, that it accommodates all the different equipment that you might have. Now, having said that, architecturally, make sure it's big enough. I can't stress stress that enough. Realistically. The architects want to squeeze as much space out of you as possible. But 
So that's where it's important not to just ask for the minimum. Uh, because also you know that when you're going to specify this stuff, even though you have a basis of design, you're going to have or equals out there. And those or equals are not going to be the exact same dimensions. So if you give them exactly what you need and your piece of equipment comes out into the field and it is not your basis of design, it is another, it is another approved design, so it, uh, approved submittal, it may be six inches in a specific direction that really just throws a wrench into everything that you're doing. So don't just ask for the minimum. Understand where the clearances are, what you need, um, and understand the dimensions of your uh, equipment that you're specifying. I mean, that's that's one thing. If you want to be, you want to go the extra mile, uh, take a look at your or equals uh, and understand exactly what kind of dimensions those have as well. And, uh, you know, that, that way you can uh, kind of play it safe. Now, I want to take uh, a minute to talk about the, the second factor, which is talk about the codes. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the electrical codes here, the electrical codes, and they talk about all the clearances that you need. Um, now, it's important to not just take what I say as gospel. You, you want to do your own due diligence. You want to check into the codes in your local area for the exact parameters that you're going to have to design to. So I'm just talking about some things that, that I know that maybe apply locally, uh, but you want to definitely school yourself up on the knowledge uh, if, uh, you know, if it's in the United States, if it's Canada, uh, Canadian codes, uh, or elsewhere around the world. You want to make sure that you have th this information um, available to you. Um, and again, the codes, the codes are a minimum. Um, you don't have to keep to a minimum. Uh, kind of what I'm going to talk about here is kind of a little bit more common sense. So you can actually go beyond what the code has said. Has said. Um, but, you know, understand that every square foot that you take out of a, uh, a building is, is one less rentable square foot or one less usable square foot. So it's not like you can take a lot of space. But, again, don't just go for the minimum. Um, so what happens uh, as far as codes go? Um, electrical clearances. Now, electrical clearances, basically this is where something is energized. You need to have, based on voltage, you need to have a certain amount of clearance. Uh, now, here in the U.S., it's, it's for you know, a certain voltage range. Typically, it's going to be three feet. Um, or if it's above a certain voltage range, it might jump to uh, three and a half feet. So that is kind of what you need from the working area. And basically, the working area, I'm sure there's, you know, very detailed instructions on exactly what that is. But if it's, you know, the face of a panel, uh, take it from the face of the panel. Don't necessarily, you know, I guess don't split hairs on this. Don't say, okay, well, it's somewhere in the panel. No, just take the face of the panel, back it off three feet, and have that be your clearance. Um, and, you know, give yourself a couple more feet or a couple more inches. You know, not all panels are the same depth, so you might have, you know, something that, that could, could play a little havoc again. Um, and, you know, it's I guess it's important to note is that when you're – talking about these clearances they are code clearances so if your design does not meet code clearances um, you're going to have to have a variance from the authority having jurisdiction and basically what you're saying is like mr authority having jurisdiction i want you to sign your name and write off that this is going to be safe enough for somebody to work on it and they won't get hurt um, now, if you think about that and let, let that sink in a little bit, there's not many people out there that are going to stick, your, stick their neck out for something that you didn't think through. Now, I know a lot of the electrical clearances may be, you might, you know, obviously there's a lot of mechanical people out there that might say, hey, you know what, wh why should we bother? Um, well, it's important to note that, you know, Everything that we put in there that uses electricity is going to have this electrical clearance issue. 
Um, so we want to make sure that everything is as safe as possible, uh, whether it be like a disconnect switch uh, that's on the wall or a, a VFD drive, or even uh, when you're talking about control panels, um, those, gonna, those are going to have power to them as well. So those need uh, to have that clearance. Now, not only do you have to have the clearance, um, you know, that depth away from the panel, and that's, that's, you know, if you think about it, that's so the, the uh, contractor, whoever's working on the piece of equipment, has the space that they need. They're not pinched up against that panel and trying to kind of shimmy around it and may accidentally, you know, reach in and touch something that uh, a, a conductor that's hot uh, and, you know, get electrocuted. I mean, that's, that's, that's why you want to give them enough space. You want to give them the space. You want to give them the floor space around there. That's why you can't necessarily have something in front of it. Uh, if you, a lot of times, uh, you know, especially when things get jam-packed in there, um, a lot of times with the transformer, you're, you're going to see the transformer that might be uh, sitting on the ground, pad-mounted transformer, uh, and you're going to have a disconnect switch for that transformer. Uh, now, you can't have that, that disconnect switch Behind the transformer, you have to have that free area clear in front of the transformer. Um, now, you also need 30 inches of width. I mean, this is kind of basically shoulder to shoulder. So, again, it makes common sense. Um, do you want to limit it to 30 inches? No. Um, if you have two panels that are side by side, do they each need their own 30 inches? No, you can kind of overlap, but it has to have, you have to have 30 inches of clearance per panel. Um, and then they, you know, again, they can overlap, they can share space. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the width and the depth. Now, you also need above and below clearance. Now, this is kind of critical, you know, just above, the, you know, the actual outline of the panel. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't go out very far, uh, but it does go down and it goes up. Uh, typically, it's going to go to the floor and it's going to go up to the structural ceiling. Now, that doesn't include if you have a, uh, a lay-in ceiling. Uh, you have to include the space above that, but it has to go like six feet above the, the top of the panel. That's kind of the, the clearance that you're basically saying, Mr. Electrician, you have from the floor to your panel and six feet above it, and this is what the space that you have to work with and safely, you know, basically safely work with uh, to install your devices. So you don't want to end up putting piping or anything like that. Generally speaking, when you're talking about electrical rooms, you want to avoid uh, putting in any piping, uh, any equipment that's going to be over these pieces of equipment. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a code violation. Uh, if, it, you, if, if you do have enough clearance above it and you still have piping that's running above it, uh, you will be required to put like a drain pan or a drip pan above it. So you don't want, obviously, electricity and water don't mix. You want to keep those two, two things separated. So if there's any risk of something dripping or there might be a leak somewhere, you want to make sure that you kind of give that uh, space as much as you possibly can. Now, I, I guess when we talk about uh, electrical equipment, sometimes, uh, or electrical components, uh, sometimes, and I ran into this at uh, one of my last projects, you have access, uh, electrical access, uh, to equipment on the roof. Now, this was a chiller that was on the roof, and obviously one end of the chiller is where the electrical service comes in, so you need to be able to work on that uh, very safely. Now, the only problem is this was like six feet in the air, so you, they needed to add a, uh, a separate structure to that for an electrician to be able to safely work on that piece of equipment. Now, that's one of the things that if, if you're thinking about ahead of time, um, it's obviously cheaper to put it in the design than it is to add it after. So if there are some pieces of equipment that have electrical components to them, you want to make sure that you have distance and clearance. Uh, also, an, another reason that I'm kind of talking about uh, maintenance, uh, equipment maintenance clearances now is that, you know, right now I'm kind of showing uh, to my mailing list, I, I have a, you know, photo flaw game that I play. And this one, I put in a, um, a picture of an air handling unit. And again, air handling unit had one of the ends. That's where the uh, electrical maintenance 
access was, but there's a screen wall. And again, you know, this is something that you just can't easily move a screen, screen wall. You can't move the equipment. You can't move the screen wall. Uh, luckily, I think there's, there was a scenario where the, uh, you could throw the disconnect switch on one side of the unit to kind of isolate everything. So I think that worked out. But you still had uh, the, the problem of taking off the, the panels because there just wasn't that 36 inches. There wasn't enough space. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's really a serious concern, uh, especially on the roof. When they, uh, the architect, you know, who doesn't like any sort of mechanical equipment at all being seen, they want to they isolate that. They want to protect that. And, again, they're going to they're gonna cram those. Uh, you know, they, they want to pay for extra paneling uh, to hide this on the, uh, on the roof. So they're going to take that screen wall and they're going to push it right up against the unit as much as they, as much as you'll let them. Uh, and you need to really stand firm on this. You need to say, Hey, you know what? You need the maintenance. You need the maintenance all the way around. There's things that are going to make it difficult to begin with. So you want to make sure that, you know, just think from a maintenance standpoint, can you get all the way around? Um, if you're, if there's are, if there are electrical components that you have to have access to, do you have 36 inches? Do you have three and a half feet? Um, you know, I, I guess in, in Canada it's 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 one meter. So, um, so that is it with the the electrical component. Now, what about the another factor is, you know, how is this equipment being maintained? How is this being done? Now, you know, it, it kind of covers the gambit. You can have uh, things like condensing boilers. And, and a lot of this, you're going to have to check with the maintenance and the manufacturer and see exactly what their clearance requirements. Some are very, you know, most of them are very specific on what they need. And they will tell you, um, and kind of looking by looking at it, you know exactly how this piece of equipment is to be maintained. Um, that doesn't always, again, these are just minimums. If you have a little bit more space, space is more than welcome. Uh, I know you can probably, it's like, for example, the condensing units or the condensing boilers, um, you can kind of cram those right together, uh, side by side. They don't need side access. Um, but if you do, then it might be more difficult to do certain maintenance tasks. It won't be impossible. You can still do the maintenance. Um, again, it's a minimum clearance, uh, but it just doesn't require any clearance on the side. But you might want to throw that in there just in case. It just makes it easier to get around, to move around. Um, if, you know, what have It just, just, again, food for thought when you're laying out your mechanical rooms. All right, what about, what about like pumps? Uh, pumps, uh, if you have end suction pumps with a big heavy motor, um, are you going to need to be able to get a lift in there and, and pull that motor? Some of these things that you're going to replace are just way too heavy for a maintenance man to, to lift, so you might need some sort of uh, mechanical device to be able to lift it up. Uh, in some cases, when you see multiple pumps in a row, if you see like a central plant that has multiple pumps in a row, more than likely you're going to have some sort of overhead, uh, you know, pulley and chain fall system that they're going to be able to kind of, you know, just push down over the uh, over that that uh, motor and just use the uh, the pulley system and kind of you know winch that up and kind of move it around that way. Those are pretty slick, but, you know, there again, that might not necessarily be an option for you, but it's something that you should think about. How are you going to, you know, if you were the maintenance man, how would you actually go ahead and, you know, remove a motor or access a fan? Um, obviously, and other things that you want to do, anything that's on the floor, you want to get it off the floor a little bit. There's, there's a lot of potential for water <clears throat> kind of spreading around the floor you know the drains might not be sloped properly um not, yeah, i mean the floor might be not sloped properly to to kind of drain um to the drain locations so you want to be able to make sure that you put it on a ho housekeeping pad keep the equipment dry keep it free from damage and just have a dedicated spot for it it's it's something that's nice to do um 
for equipment just to put it out on a housekeeping pad. Um, also, uh, some of the things for air handling units um, and chillers. Air handling units, you have coil poles for, um, or you have coil poles, and those are for your uh, your cooling coils, your heating coils. These are some devices that they can't necessarily be broken down. So you're going to need like the entire width of the unit to be able to pull that out the side of an air handling unit. Um, if you have, if you ever need to replace that, uh, why would you need to replace that? Maybe there's a, a, a leak in multiple spots. Uh, maybe you had a, uh, a freeze condition uh, that just totally wrecked the coil. Um, maybe it's, it's, it's something that you needed more capacity. Uh, whatever it might be, you might end up being, you know, you can leave the casing of an air handling unit there and just pull out some of the components. You can pull out the fan, you can pull out the, uh, the coil. Um, and again, it's not necessarily an easy task, but it's so much more difficult if you don't have the space Aside from that, uh, and when you're drawing this stuff, make sure you put the uh, the, the dashed line um, that shows that for people, so they actually know. I mean, if people look at a piece of equipment and there's a dashed line that's next to it, they can understand that that's some sort of maintenance access that needs to be left in place, and that things shouldn't go there. Now, when you're talking about uh, some boilers and chiller tubes. Um, those are, you know, again, the, the length of the unit, they might need to get pulled out there for whatever reason. If it's cracked, if it's damaged, if something needs to be done, if it needs to be repaired, um, even if you're cleaning it, you know, those cleaning rods that, um, you know, the, the giant just, uh, brushes that they shove in there, they have a little bend to them, but they're not, you know, they're still long. So you want to be able to maintain that, uh, clearance for doing that and, and pulling those tubes from the chillers. Um, if you're not sure exactly what, you know, if I'm, I'm talking Greek here, if you don't know what, uh, you know, the, the tubes in a chiller are or tubes in a boiler are, um, you know, go ahead and Google that and uh, take a look at what a, a, like a centrifugal chiller is or a, you know, wet back or a dry back boiler might look like inside. Um, and ultimately, you know, all the things with maintenance is you want to make sure, and again, I've stressed this before, I know, but ultimately, what about replacing those pieces of equipment? What are you going to, what are you going to do when they need to be replaced? You know, what are you going to do? Um, are they in a situation where you have to move other, uh, devices, equipment before you can pull that out? Or is it something that's well laid out that you can just wheel out? wheel a new one back in and everything you know just reconnects and it's real smooth real easy doesn't take a lot of time doesn't take a lot of extra money to be able to rearrange things and deconstruct things so those are some of the things that you need to think about maintenance wise for this access now uh i guess the last factor i want to talk about is what about operation now, I know that, you know, when we're talking about boilers, there's clearance to combustibles. Basically, you know, things that are hot, you want to make sure that there's enough space and distance. Um, that not only uh, accounts for the, the boiler and the, uh, uh, you know, the boilers themselves, uh, also includes the flue, uh, the flue gas and up through the roof. Obviously, you need that clearance to combustible uh, distance, and you need to make sure that that is in place. Now, for air-cooled equipment, you know, this goes for condensing unit, this goes for air-cooled chillers, this goes for cooling towers. Everything needs a lot more space than just access. They, they need to breathe. Um, a lot of times, they're going to be they're going to be hidden. They're going to be put next to you know whatever. They really they need to breathe, and they need to have extra access. Um, Otherwise, you're going to end up derating the performance of the equipment. Um, obviously, you know if you put a cooling tower in a area well, um, so it's nice and tucked away. You got to make sure. Obviously, if any of the walls are louvered, it's going to be one distance. If they're solid walls, it's going to be a lot more distance uh, in general. And when you're talking about uh, uh, also uh, different equipment. 
um, if you put a lot of uh, condensing units next to each other, if you put a you know long string of cooling towers next to each other. There are, and you know, I've seen studies with using again, kind of we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about the computational fluid dynamics. Um, that is something that is is really interesting because, you know, obviously the heat rejected off these units can be entrained entrained back into other units down the road. Um, now that's not something that you necessarily have to you know think about every time, but if it's if it's of critical importance, uh, you might want to take a moment and uh, you know discuss that in your organization. Say, hey, you know what? Do we need to look a little bit deeper into this, or we can kind of just assume that we're going to have enough capacity? That it's it's not that critical if we only have you know, 90% of capacity because we're kind of in training some of the heat and it's kind of, you know, coming back into the, um, the units being drawn, redrawn back through. So that's, that's some of the things that you have to be especially uh, careful about when you talk about air-cooled equipment. A lot more space, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, to have 7 feet, 10 feet, 14 feet is not uncommon when you're talking about uh, you know cooling towers and things like that, so it's a it's a lot more in the in the grand scheme of things than just maybe like a three foot for maintenance, um, you know. And and again, you know, when you talk about clearance to combustible, you know, we might talk about a foot or less. Um, so that is just something that you need to be aware of. Um, a lot of to a lot of times too, you know, when you talk about the uh, the maintenance, or the not the maintenance, but the uh, the contractors. Ultimately, you know, the problem occurs is if something changes or something was an as you know or equal. Uh, the contractor is going to do the best that they can. Uh, you know, they it, it was a piece of equipment that you specified that you designed around, um, and they're going to try to make it fit the best they can. But if they need to start moving walls, um or requesting that walls be moved, or if it's, it totally changes the layout of an equipment room just because you didn't have enough space, uh, that, that can happen. And again, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the trade-off between, hey, you know what, I designed it and laid it out this way, but it doesn't work. So they're going to have to go out and engineer it in the field, and you know, that's, that's the kind of RFI you don't want. Uh, to have coming back at you, you want to make sure that there's there is enough room and enough clearance that you don't have to re-engineer a mechanical room or an electrical space um, to be able to make sure that everything can be maintained, has the right clearance, and will operate as designed and will meet code. So. All right, thanks so much for listening. I hope this was helpful. If you know anybody looking for more information about this topic, consider passing this episode along. Uh, like I said at the top of the show, if you're not a subscriber, consider joining the growing community of people just like you over at HVAC360.com and get some weekly goodness. Uh, if you want to go a step further, again, that membership site is open now uh, for a limited time only at a deep discount, and we're only taking a, uh, a few dozen people in and then we're closing the doors for a couple of months to get things sorted out. So uh, go over there and get that done. If you want to leave me a review on iTunes, I'd greatly appreciate that. That helps everybody uh, give uh, get this information to them and helps the community in general learn and know more about HVAC. So uh, if you do that, I'll give you a shout out as I have in the past. Greatly appreciate that. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of HVAC 360. I'm Matt Nelson, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. And as always, know what you build and share what you know. 